Hello and welcome again. So in this video, we'll talk about the security aspects of the digital signature algorithm. Uh, and this will be the last video uh, I'll do on the DSA. So there are several things that we're going to talk about. The first one is we're going to talk about the two different discrete logarithms attacks that can be done uh, on the DSA to recuperate the private key, which will be, of course, breaking the DSA the signature because once the attacker knows the private key and then that attacker can sign any messages all right so let's recall uh, before we go into the details let's recall that the public key for the dsa for the digital signature algorithm is four numbers the first two are the prime numbers so the q device p minus one alpha is a generator of order q and this number b that is here is this number alpha to the private key that is d which is what I have here. So this is what should tell you here that a logarithm attack will be possible so you can recuperate the private key D from knowing uh, what B is and what alpha is and of course what P is. So that's the first attack. So the attacker could compute the uh, private key, which is D in this case, by doing this uh, discrete log. So the discrete log of base alpha of B and this is all in the group CP star. Now, of course, as we always mention with this logarithm attacks, uh, this will not be feasible uh, in current times because the prime key is quite, uh, quite long, it's 1024 bit, so it's not feasible with current algorithms and computational speed. Now, that doesn't mean that this will not be feasible in the future. We don't know if there are other algorithms that could be uh, feasible in this particular case but for now it's not feasible now i want to mention a little bit more about that attack now as i said the prime p is 1024 bit length uh, in the uh, initial setup for the dsa uh, usually when that is the case this will require about 2 to the 80 operations or operations here is a very general term that i'm using i'm not talking about multiplications or divisions of any kind of thing this operation here for for me, it will mean steps. So the number of steps that you have to take to compute the discrete lock is 2 to the 80 steps, which could be multiplications, additions, all sorts of things. So whenever that happens, we're going to say that that is the, sec the security level of this is going to be 80 bit. So 80 bit security level means that you will need 2 to the 80 operations to do or to perform this uh, discrete lock. Now, if you think that that's not a big number, that's actually a very huge number. So 2 to the 80 is this number here. That will be the number of steps required to perform the discrete log. And let me put that in perspective. Now, all I'm doing here is a kind of an approximation. And this operation that I'm uh, doing here, this is not really um, uh, very specific. But let me give you just an idea uh, on how big that number is. So one of the fastest supercomputers today and by today I mean November of 2016, it can perform about uh, this number of operations. So 93 times 10 to the 15 operations a second. And these operations are really operations, so uh, floating po point operations in this case. And you see I'm comparing these two, which is not quite the same, but for the sake of an example, let's just do this kind of approximation just to give you an idea on how uh, long this will take for this supercomputer. So this computer will take about this many seconds, 1.29, 1.3 uh, times 10 to the 7 seconds to perform that number of operations, 2 to the 80. And that is about uh, 3 months. Um, now, let's recall that, that that is the fastest computer today, which is not, will not be the same tomorrow or will not be the same next year or will not be the same when you are watching this video. So it might be faster. But, so just keep in mind that working at fuel capacity this computer will take three months and this is the fastest computer uh today which is uh, of course feasible but this is, of course is just an approximation so the actual figure will be larger than this just to give you an idea on how how, how big this number of operations is now the second attack that can be performed on on the dsa the digital signature algorithm it's also a discrete log computing exactly the same thing. So I'm going to compute the discrete log on base alpha of B. But now we're going to use a little bit of extra information. The extra information is that 
I have a factor of p minus 1 that I know what it is. That's the prime q. So that's some extra information that Eve has, the attacker, because this q is part of the public uh, key, which is known. p is known, q is known, alpha and b are known. And q is about 160 bit um, length. Now, there is an algorithm called the Pauling Hillman algorithm that is possible that finds discrete logs if you know of the factorization of p minus 1. Now, uh, we know some factor here of p minus 1, which is q, which is given to us because that's part of the public key. Now, knowing that, uh, of course, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do any details of this algorithm. So this algorithm is to compute discrete logs also, like the giant step, baby step algorithm. Um, not exactly the same algorithm, but uh, something to compute discrete logs. So this algorithm will uh, use the Q's a factor of P minus 1 and will try to compute that one. Now the problem with that is it will also require this number of operation. So this is, some people call this is an attack on the subgroup. The subgroup just using the fact that Q is a divisor of p minus 1 and we know what q is. Now, let me give you an idea on what the security levels are. Now, I didn't talk about this earlier, about what p and q, we will be, we always use 1024 for the bit length of p and 160 for the bit length of q. That doesn't have to be the case all the time. You can use another types of parameters. So here in this table, I have the parameters that are, um, suggested by the standard and you can also use a, a p of 2048 bit length and then you also have to update of course the q which is would be t uh, 224 bit length and you can also use this length here 3072 with a q of 256 bit length so you can use this uh, kind of parameters and the prime generation is is similar in in these cases now the security level is something that i would i talked about earlier in the video is for this uh, setup PQ of uh, P of 1024 and Q of 160 the security level is 80 which means that it requires 2 to the 80 steps to compute a discrete log which is I, I told you here is about three months in the fastest supercomputer today now for this pair of uh, choices here the second row here uh, the security level is uh, 112, which means that using a discrete logarithm uh, attack will require 112, 2 to the 112 operations or steps. Now, in that case, the time using a supercomputer will be uh, 1902 million years. So, that case, of course, even with the fastest supercomputer today, it is not possible. And it's even not possible, of course, with the larger uh, choices for P and Q, which will give a security level of 256, which means I have to do 2 to the 256 operations, or in this case, steps, and that will take this uh, million years. This number of years of years is, of course, larger than the age of the universe. It's, of course, not feasible. This is all approximations, and don't take this as an actual... Um, exact figure, they are not. It's just an, uh, just to give you an idea on how uh, the security level is matched with time. So this is all the things that you can also use for the DSA now. So these other two uh, setups here. Now, the the other feature I'm going to talk about about the DSA, the security is, the DSA is also vulnerable if the ephemeral keys are reused. If you watch the videos on the Elgamal signature algorithm, uh, we talked about over there um, on why you should not use the ephemeral key because if you actually do, then the attacker could uh, get uh, could recuperate the uh, the private key, which is of course uh, really bad. And that attack is going to be actually similar to the attack of the Elgamal list. Now, I suggest you go back and watch the Elgamal attack when you use the F metal key when you reuse it because it's going to be very similar to that. So let's suppose, uh, I'm not going to go into much details here because it's very similar to the Elgamal, but I'm going to give you a rough idea on how would you compute the private key 
if the ephemeral key is reduced. Now let's remember that when you have the DSA, the digital signature algorithm, so you have the messages M1 and M2 with the signatures R1S1, R2S2. So these are the two packages that are sent through the insecure channel. So Bob sends these two packages to Alice, and of course Alice can see these numbers here. Now if, which is the attacker in this case, will know for sure that the ephemeral key is reduced if she looks at the second number here, the R's in the packages. So if R1 is equal to R2, Eve knows that the ephemeral key was reused. And why is that? Because remember, what? how do you compute the R, this, uh, this part of the signature for the DSA? What you do is you take the generator alpha, to the ephemeral key, modulo P and then modulo Q. Now alpha, P and Q are fixed. They are part of the public key. The ephemeral key is that part of the uh, signature process that you use when you use that uh, random number there. So you, this is the random number that you choose. But this, let's say you use it twice. So if you use this twice, then of course you're gonna get the same R. So that's why you get this number the same here. So it will know that the ephemeral key is reduced if she sees that these two numbers are the same. R1 is equal to R2. And why is that bad? Similar to what happened with the Elga model. So if you recall how the second part of the signature is computed, for the first message, which is the, signature, the part of the signature S1, is the hash function of M1 plus the private key times R, which R is the common uh, value of R1 and R2 because it's the same because the ephemeral key was reused and the ephemeral key modulo Q. That's how you compute the second part of the signature. And the same is uh, true for the second messages uh, is the hash function of M2 plus the private key times R, which is the common value of the ephemeral key Q. Now, if you look at what I uh, wrote down over here, uh, the, the letters here that are uh, highlighted here with this kind of uh, green uh, color, that's what Eve knows. So Eve knows S1 and S2 because that's part of the package that was sent to the channel. She can also compute the hash function because of course uh, this is public knowledge. How to compute hash functions of the messages and the messages are also known because they were sent through the channel. R is also known because that's part of the signature. This is the common value. The ephemeral key, we don't know what it is. So this will be an unknown here, and of course D will be unknown, but Q is known because it's part of the public uh, key. If you look at these two equations here, these two e equations have two unknowns. One of them is the private key D, and the other one is the ephemeral key. Now, if you recall that from algebra and something also that we did the, in the Elga mode, we have two equations, two unknowns. It is possible to solve for both of them. So I can now, uh, capture the value of D and the ephemeral key. So if Eve realizes that the ephemeral key was used, which is very easy to check, which is just checking that the R's are the same, she can set up these equations and solve for D and the ephemeral key. And that would be, of course, pretty bad because then E will know the private key. So that's pretty much uh, all I have to say about the DSA algorithm. And so in the next video, we'll continue with other uh, topics on uh, applied cryptography. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.